Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our third class on the Gospel of John. I pray that you have enjoyed this series so far and that you look forward to each installment as I post them. I have appreciated the comments that I have received, and I am encouraged by each and every one of them. As a quick recap, we spent some time a couple of weeks ago with a brief overview of the book. And then last week, we dealt specifically with the signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus performed in this book. For this class, we're going to focus our time on the I Am statements that Jesus makes in this book. As always, we want to remember what the focus of our study is specifically. We want to get to know Jesus on a more personal level and give us assurance of who he is and what he proclaimed to be. The theme of the book, again, in chapter 20 and verse 31, let's read that together again. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So last week we mentioned that the miracles that Jesus performed lent credence to what he proclaimed to be. This week when we look at some of the statements that Jesus makes describing himself, we can also get a better look at the divine nature of Jesus and how he shares existence with God and the Holy Spirit, and how we can take comfort in his words and his actions that he truly is the Son of God. Before we get into breaking down each specific I am statement, and again, capital I, capital A, capital M, I am, meaning part of the divine threefold existence of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, I want to just say one thing about them. Jesus, although generally quite plain spoken and transparent, uses these phrases about himself and, I will admit, might be confusing to someone who's not thinking in that frame of mind. For those of you that have seen the Back to the Future trilogy, you'll know what I mean when I say that Marty is often accused by Doc Brown of not thinking fourth dimensionally. Uh, That fourth dimension in this case being time travel. But in the time of Jesus, All of these things were understandably hard to comprehend and would not be fully comprehended until after his death and when all things were revealed. Thankfully, we have the full revelation of God and can dissect these statements and to fully understand what Jesus was revealing about himself to help us better see Jesus for who he truly was. As we begin today, please turn to chapter 6 and we'll find the first I am statement there. Let's read verse 35 together. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Okay, so first some context. If you've been listening to the previous classes, you know that this section of scripture is is very soon after the feeding of the 5,000 people and the subsequent walking on the water that we talked about. This is the very next day, find that in verse 22. So Jesus is going to make this statement to his disciples using bread as the metaphor here, since it was fresh in their minds. The people go so far as to ask Jesus, just after making this bread last for at least 5,000 plus people, to show them a sign so that they can believe. I can just see Jesus kind of putting his hands on his face and rubbing his hair like, what do I have to do here? The people then mention their ancestors, and it goes back to Exodus chapter 16 and verse 35, and how their fathers ate manna in the wilderness when God was delivering his people. Jesus corrects them that it was not Moses who gave them the bread, but rather God who gave them the bread to sustain them then, and and now he has given them bread in the form of Jesus to give life to the world. So that gets us back to verse 35, when Jesus flatly tells them he is this bread of life, that they can have and not hunger and not thirst. We have to remember in this instance that bread was a staple of the Jewish diet at this time. So for Jesus to remind them that bread sustained them physically, he will now sustain them spiritually by eventually dying on the cross for their sins. We must remember that just as bread must be actually eaten to sustain physical life, so also must we invite Christ into our daily lives and in order to have a sustained spiritual life. So may we each search to find that spiritual filling from God and Jesus in our lives so that we can live it out and 
through our thoughts and through our actions each and every day as a Christian who's striving to have that sustaining spiritual life that Jesus has promised here with this I am statement. In the second place, let's turn to chapter 8 and we'll read verse 12 together. Chapter 8 and verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So here, Jesus declares himself as the light of the world. Again, I think some context here is crucial to understanding why Jesus chooses this time to make this particular statement. This statement comes immediately after a woman is caught in adultery, and the Pharisees use this opportunity to try and trap Jesus to be able to charge him with something. But Jesus tells them that he who is without sin should cast the first stone, verse number 7. And so the Pharisees are turned away here. Jesus then tells them that he is the light of the world so that they would know they do not have to live in the darkness, hopelessness, and bondage of sin any longer. Following him would bring light to their lives by transforming them and restoring them to a life worthy of his calling. Think of all the Old Testament promises of the coming of the light of salvation and the light of God. And although we're not going to turn to them here, I'll just mention them and you can write them down for future reference, such as uh, Exodus chapter 25 and 37, uh, Leviticus 24 and verse 2, Psalms 27, 1, Isaiah 9, 2, etc. Then even into the New Testament in places like Acts chapter 13 and 47. Ephesians 5, 8 and following, and and even 1 John 1 and following. Even at the start of this book, John mentions that Jesus is the light of the world and how the light shone in darkness and darkness could not overcome it. That's verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1. So the people and the disciples would have been very aware of what the light represented. Think back to the temple when the people worshipped at this time. Candles would burn to symbolize the pillar of fire that led the Israelites to safety. It represented God's protection and presence and guidance. So, is he the light of your world? What does it mean to follow the light of Christ? We follow the advice of trusted people in our lives, and so should we also follow the commands of the Word of God in this Bible. I would be remiss if I did not at least mention the response of the Pharisees in the next verses. They think that Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic. However, Jesus offers them a third alternative. That alternative is that he is telling the truth. And the Pharisees refused to believe that truth and so never recognized him as their Lord and Savior. If we really want to know more about who Jesus was through his book, We should look honestly and and not close any doors that our study might open for us to know more about the truth of Jesus. In the next place, Jesus refers to himself as the door in chapter 10 and verse 9. Let's read that together. Chapter 10 and verse 9. It says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Again, context here is needed. Just before this verse, Jesus is talking about everyone who came before him were thieves and robbers and and that the sheep did not hear him. So Jesus is clearly trying to get them to understand that he is the only way to salvation. And he is the door or the gate, some versions may say, that we have to go through to get that. There may be others that try to say that they are the way or provide another means, but that is simply not the case, and we must use Jesus' blood to cleanse our sins only. I think another point here to consider is the comfort that we can find in the sheep pen. Being in Christ or through that door is going through him and allowing for the assurance of God's provision. In looking down at verse 10 here, Let's read that. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We see a hint here of our theme and where we're told that we can have life 
and we can have it more abundantly. Not just salvation in heaven, but a life of service to God and Jesus here on earth can also have its blessings and provisions. I pray that we each search and try and strive each day to have that life. Number next, let's stay right where we are and pick up with the continuation of the previous thought. And let's look at verse 11 together. We'll read a little bit more in this instance down to verse number 16. So I'm in chapter 10, verse number 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that I are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. In continuation of the thoughts about sheep and protection, Jesus refers to himself here as the good shepherd. In these times, sheep and shepherd would have been well known, much more than they would be today, I would dare say. You know, we might see more with our own pets how a cat or a dog might know our own voice. And we recognize those that protect us, that provide for us, that that watch out for us. Now, I suppose there are some of you that would lay down your life for your pet, but that is another class altogether. But, you know, we back then the shepherd would literally lay in front of the gate to protect the flock that was inside. He would fight off anything that threatened to harm his flock. And Jesus is saying that he is also that shepherd for us. And we know that subsequent to this statement, he literally would give up his life to save us through his crucifixion. And as we read in that famous 23rd Psalm, we can trust Jesus not only for salvation through him, but for safety, protection, and restoration of our souls. Fifth, let's move to chapter 11, and we're going to start reading in verse 25. 11, starting verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And for our context here, let's let's remember that Jesus makes this statement after Martha, the sister of Lazarus, comes to meet Jesus after Jesus has arrived in Bethany, but Lazarus is already dead. Martha says that if, you know, if Jesus had been here, that Lazarus would not have died. But she does trust Jesus no matter what. And so Jesus says, Lazarus will rise again. Martha misunderstands the moment and mentions that she assumes he's talking about rising again in the last resurrection of the last day. Then Jesus makes the statements that we read in verse 25 and 26. Jesus does not make Martha wait until the resurrection to see Lazarus. But, you know, we, we see that, and he, he, as it's later, he's mentioned in the chapter that he's raised, Jesus prefaces this miracle that we have already discussed in detail by making this I am statement and, and laying the groundwork for what he is about to do, not just to Lazarus, but to the whole world through his death. Jesus is not only giving us an insight into his divine nature and power over death here. He is reminding all of those who hear this that some will die physically, as Lazarus has temporarily done here, but all of us will die physically, but we will live spiritually for eternity in some place. Whether that be heaven or hell would be decided by how we live our lives and if we have put on Christ in baptism and made an effort to live like him. One other takeaway we can have here in in general, is that Jesus is the resurrection. He brings life to the physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually dead. 
that should give us great comfort. And I hope that it does for you. If not, it may be time to study more about Jesus and to work on your faith. Number six, this one can be found in chapter 14. All right, this is in the midst of that great set of verses that many of us are familiar with. So to that end, I'm going to start reading in verse 1, and we'll go through chapter 7. Again, this is chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. Before we get into this statement, what a great statement there by Jesus telling us that the things that we have been so seen so far from him have allowed us to see the nature of God as they are in fact one and the same person. But here Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's pretty straightforward from our Lord right there. But there, you know, there are not multiple ways to God. There are not many ways to be saved. There are not many faiths. Jesus is it. You want to get to heaven and God, then you have to have the blood of Jesus to cleanse your sins. You don't have to be active on Facebook or Instachat or Snapgram or whatever all the names are to see that there are so many different ideas in this world about how to be a faithful Christian. But all of these different ways are born out of selfishness, if you ask me. Everyone wants that Burger King religion, as we like to call it. They they want to have it their way. If something in the Bible is too hard or is something that they don't want to do, then they don't have to do it. At least that's what they think. Well, guess what? They're wrong. Any ideas, concepts, or philosophies that go against Jesus are not truth. Think back to chapter 8 and verse 32 where John will say, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He was talking about himself in that instance. And when we come to understand who Jesus was and what he came to do, we can have freedom through him. Much like when the curtain of the temple was torn, and we now have access to Jesus and his saving power. In the final place, let's look at John chapter 15. I'm going to start in verse 1. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So here in verses 1 and 5, Jesus refers to himself as the vine. Now, unfortunately, I have a rather brown thumb when it comes to gardening, I'll have to admit. But I do understand a little bit of how plants and vines work and live. And understanding this important concept helps believers to live faithful and victorious lives. A vine dresser is going to do two things. 
First, he'll remove the unfruitful branches that threaten to choke away the life from the fruitful branches. And second, he will continue to prune even the fruitful and faithful branches in order to bear more fruit. Jesus describes himself as the vine and his followers as the branches. In order to bear the fruit that is expected of us as Christians, we must be rooted and connected to Jesus Christ. We must remain connected to him and not rely on our own strength. Why? Because without being connected to the source of all good things, we can do nothing. Well, nothing of eternal value anyway. And so abiding in him will involve being that believing that Jesus is the Son of God, being baptized into his blood and following the commands of God we find in the Bible, while continuing to search the scriptures and sharing that belief and that knowledge with others who might not yet be abiding in Christ. Or as verse 6 would indicate, we need to share with those who might have once been Christians but have fallen away. And that is a tough challenge for us. As we conclude today, I want you to think back with me to the book of Exodus. Moses and God are having a conversation about leading the Israelites out of bondage. Moses is a little reluctant to do it, and so he asked God for some reasons why. We're not going to go into the the signs and things like that that God showed him, but God tells him in chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 13, and again, this is in Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, excuse me, and he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Fast forward now to when Jesus was on the earth and he is a type of Moses because he came to deliver people from their sins and spiritual captivity. John demonstrated that the I am in Exodus was now physically standing in front of all of these people, ready to be their shepherd, the door to the Father, their life, their vine, their light, their bread of life, and the truth. He is the I am, the God of the now, ready to be whatever we need him to be in our lives. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Is God your I am? If not, I pray that this class may in some way help you to to see Jesus for who he was and help you build your faith so that you can once again say that you believe Jesus is the Son of God and that you're willing to make him your Lord and your Savior by putting him on in baptism and then living a life worthy of the calling that Jesus gave us through these scriptures. I pray that this class has been a blessing to you and that you all continue to be safe and healthy. Lord willing, next time we'll discuss the time that Jesus spent with his disciples in the upper room. There's a lot to cover there, so it may be a couple of different classes, or we may go in a different direction altogether. I'll decide soon. Either way, I look forward to seeing you at the next opportunity. God bless.